today, my writing is on the chopping block. So you're going to want to stay tuned for this critique session. Hi, welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian dystopian fiction. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Jamie Hirschberger, and I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Um, if you are listening to us on any of our places where we stream our what is it called where you listen the podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh my brain my, this is gonna be such a great episode i'm so I'm saying. if you want to peek into what my brain is doing to me today then stay tuned for the writing of the backs that's all i have to say <laughs> the writing of the backs that's a new episode a new section of our episode yeah that's right i just that. made that up <laughs> so the, if you listen to us on anywhere we're audio only we appreciate you and we also appreciate all of our people who show up live in our chat so if you like what we do hit like and subscribe and share and tell all your friends and just hit all the buttons except for this the down thumb don't hit that um no one cares so. about that anyway <laughs> also good morning to those in the chat we've got leah and piper and K.R. Vanderport and Barbara uh, McAfee. Good morning, everyone. Good to see y'all. I'm going to rely on you guys to um, uh oh to talk about the chat because I don't have my bifocals yet and I can't see any of it. So just so you know. Um, so we always start with a little session we like to call What's Up, where we go around the table and say what's up. So let's start with Jen this morning. What's up, Jen? <laughs> <laughs> so I woke up early this morning. And uh, so one of the things that menopause has done to me, it's making my hair curlier, but only in the front, <laughs> like only like around my face and everything else. <laughs> and then usually it's pretty frizzy. So I woke up early this morning and I'm laying in bed and I'm like, I remembered my grandmother telling me that she used to curl her hair by tying it in, um, in rags. Right. And so I'm like, why well, paper towel? And I knew, like, she used to sleep in it overnight. But I'm like, but I have a hair dryer. So I had this idea that I was going to do this. And it, like, did not work out well. Because <laughs> Did you take a picture? I did, but I did not. Let me try to, let me find oh, it. Oh, my word. She comes on to do our podcast prep. And her whole, she looked like a parade float. Because she had, like, <laughs> tissues kind of sticking up all over the place and i was like do you expect the critique to be that harsh <laughs> that you had to stock yourself with tissues in advance <laughs> well the thing is too is that i'm like i'm like i'll just use the hair dryer it was still it's still now wet right now like so the curls are already falling out so into all that effort and yes that did not go well so oh, yeah. let me see if i can share i think you anywhere a lot with of hair so I need to go live somewhere where they're having a drought and then curl my hair because that guarantees there will be rain that day, like for sure. And then there will go all the curls. Goodbye. So you should use your superpower for purposes that would be very helpful to others is what you're saying. Yes, yes. So when we were talking about this, Tina wanted to chime in and say, Jen, you're supposed to sleep with the ro with the rags in, right, Tina? Well, I was, that's just what I thought. I, yeah. I thought and that's it, what I did. Yes, and well, I was. I mean, like, that is that is how you're supposed to do it, but of course I don't do the There I am. <laughs> oh, the picture. picture. I if you're, the picture. <laughs> if you're not watching, uh, Jen just shared a beautiful picture of her being the parade float, and her mouth uh, open and her eyes closed. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it was gonna be like that. Like how pretty I am. So nice. So, well, all I wanted. To all this for you guys, it. for you two ladies. I wanted to come beautiful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we would be nicer to you when we critique your piece. How <laughs> or feel more this? sorry for me by seeing me. <laughs> you know, you can you can use Snapchat filters in StreamYard. Just saying. Oh, I am can? actually doing it right now. 
a really? Snapchat filter. Yep. What make my Snapchat hair look better? Filter. You what? could be a lion. You could have like rainbows. You could have butterflies. Oops. Sorry. I just wow. like have like getting rid of all my blemishes. <laughs> Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's going to really hurt the skincare industry. Um, I just would like to say <laughs> yeah. that, like, I don't um, care. <laughs> um, my comment was going to be like, when you go on TikTok, so TikTok is not just for terrible things. TikTok can be very educational depending on how you train it. And mm. I've seen girls do so many different things to try to curl up their hair. And the most mm -hmm. recent one that I saw was to take the belt from a robe because it's mm -hmm. terry cloth and just wind your hair around and then like tie it. And mm -hmm. supposedly it's nice because it's soft to sleep on and supposedly it does a good job of curling. But all the methods I see, they do employ the overnight situation. My hair doesn't even seem to dry like overnight. It's like, how can I have the thinnest hair in the world that never dries when it's wound up in something? It's really mm -hmm. aggravating. Right. I would have to, if I was going to do an overnight thing, I would have to probably start the morning before wear yeah. it all day long and then sleep on it. And then my, maybe it'll be, yeah, I think yeah. it's just as long, but that's why women used to go to the store in curlers, right? Yeah. I still do. Mm -hmm. I have a wedding next weekend and then we have to drive four hours up to, um, Traverse city for it. And I'm thinking I'm driving with those in my hair because yeah. I'm not unhappy with the curls and I don't want to have to actually curl my hair with the curling iron. So See, here's the thing. If you haven't figured this out yet, um, I'm kind of lazy. Like <laughs> people are like, you know, on brand. Jamie, Jamie <laughs> likes to tease me about being like the one worried about my hair and makeup and like that. But like, it's all a lazy version. Like, yes, I do like my hair. Look, nice. I do enjoy makeup, um, but it's always the lazy version. I'm not that person. If you watch someone put on makeup on these different tutorials and they're doing all these layers of like highlighter and contour and all these um, no, mm -mm. I'm not doing that. Like I just, it, it's not in me. And so my hair got time for that. And people are like, oh, you have such beautiful long hair because it's lazy. Like I, mm. I don't get it cut. Like, and I don't have to do anything. To, I can put it in a bun. That's why I have long hair because I'm lazy. So mm. that's my what's up. I'm I lazy. call it energy efficient. I don't really <laughs> care for the word lazy. Uh, <laughs> Piper says Piper. it's low maintenance, not lazy. <laughs> There Good you morning, go. Shell. Good to see you also. Uh, lots of compliments about your hair. KR Vanderport oh. says it looks great. Thank um, you. And people really like the picture that you shared. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's yep. what she meant by looks great. That was the one she thought. <laughs> yep. 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 All right. Good. What's okay. up with you, Tina? Well, today I wanted to do something a little bit different um, because I was doing my devotions this morning. And the guy that I was listening to made this comment that just really hit me. And so I'm just going to read this quote. It says, wouldn't it be interesting if the answer to the removal of all stress until you lived a relaxed life, wouldn't it be interesting if it's not found in the change of the circumstances, but is found in the intimacy of merging with Jesus. Mm. And that's Dr. Stephen Manley. And that just really hit me this morning because like, I've got all this stuff going on mm -hmm. mostly in my head and it's been stressing me out a little bit. And I'm like, and I taught a Bible study on Wednesday where from the sermon on the Mount, you know, where it says store up your treasure in heaven. And I told everybody, I said, it's not about what you do or don't do. It's about your focus. Mm -hmm. It's about having an eternal focus versus a focus on the things of this world. And I'm like, okay, just spank yourself, Tina. <laughs> right. You know, like the teacher always teaches because they are the ones that need to learn. I, mm -hmm. I really believe that. And so it just hit me this morning that um, I've let my focus, I've let my eyes wander from where they should be focused. And even without my bifocals. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all deal with that too. I myself uh, deal with that a lot too. And I think that there's some truth in that because um, I know like, well, we, I have to be honest, things in my life have been um, keeping me from being like more at peace, right? There are, there's just sometimes there's seasons in your life, but there's also times that I can, that I just get myself in my head, like you said, busy. And so I appreciate you sharing that, Tina. Thanks. What about you, Jamie? What's up with you? 
Um, <clears throat> in keeping with the little, um, what the Stoics said versus what the Bible says, I've got a Stoic quote for you today from Marcus Aurelius. <clears throat> Not really at all tied into what you were saying, Tina, but a little bit. Um, choose not to be harmed and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed and you haven't been. Um, I just thought that that was like, hmm, interesting. And is there a Bible verse that parallels to this? And uh, Proverbs 1911 popped up. The, dis the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. That's the King James. I found that the um, ESV really um, said it in a way that seems like a little more uh, approachable, and it's good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. And um, I think that it is pretty self-explanatory. So that's it. Yeah, you can choose to be offended or you can choose to uh, be forgiving. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very good. good stuff today. All right, yeah. well, that's enough. I think that's a, a good enough episode. I yeah, this we'll see you all next week. We had church. We can go home. Yeah, we don't need to do <laughs> any sort of critique on anything today. Yeah. Oh, you're we'll move on. Weasel out of it. It's not gonna, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be that bad, right? Um, I hope. Yeah, I don't think so. I would think it'll be fine. For it, I want to hear what you guys have to say. So it's all good. So Tina, you want to set us up so everybody knows what's going on? Well, we have been doing this this series about writing groups 101, critique groups 101, and we have been talking a lot about how you do an actual critique as opposed to what we usually do. Um, at the end of our podcast, which is only positive feedback. And we talk a lot about the critique sandwich. So having bread, which is positive meat, which is critique, um, constructive critique, critique given in love. And then another piece of bread, which is again, something positive that as a technique that we use in our uh, meetings when we have a critique group. And so then we decided we would just do it for you guys live. And, um, is we're each going to be on the chopping block. So I was last week and this week is Jen and next time, not next week, but next time, um, we're going to do Jamie. So that'll so, be in um, two weeks. In two weeks. Cause next so, week she's gone. It's just me and Tina. Uh Oh, oh fun, fun, fun. <laughs> shenanigans. I'm going to try not to preach. That's what I'm going to try. <laughs> um, it's so funny, though, that you said a critique given in love. And I just I don't know why, but I was like, love loaf, like olive loaf, you know, that you would like go to the deli and they would shave off some. So we have yeah, I love loaf in the middle. Pickles and olives in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mine is totally tofu. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, how we do it usually is the person who is being critiqued in our writing group. This is not like a rule. Um, we we make the person not speak until we've uh, each had our chance to say um, our meat and our bread, because that way um, there's not a whole lot of like, but that's not what I meant. And and we can actually get it all out before we hear the that's not what I meant. Um, and it helps for us to get everything said. And the person who is receiving the critique just kind of stays quiet and makes notes. And we joked about calling it you go into the chamber of silence like presumably we can't hear you even if you were to talk. Um, and then we bring you out after we're finished and ask you um, to respond. Jen, is there particular feedback you were looking for on this piece? Um, well, this is my first disaster, meaning like it's the, it's 25% into my book. And I guess I want to know if it feels like that. Um, um no, I guess, I guess, I don't know. I just want to hear what you have to say, I guess. All righty. For those of you that are just tuning in too, if, um, if you want to read this piece, we have it posted, a link to it is posted in our Facebook group. And if you're not a member of our Facebook group, you're definitely going to want to do that. It's uh, in the show notes to join. Yeah. I don't know why it's not a sandwich cookie, probably because you were not around to tell us it should be a cookie because I like cookies more than I like sandwiches, Piper. She's asking, why is our critique sandwich a real sandwich instead of a sandwich cookie? Mm. I think I know the answer to that. What is the answer to that? Because I already had a graphic that I oh. used for a Bible study. 
<laughs> Energy like, efficient. The love sandwich. <laughs> in uh, ch- in James chapter four, there's a love sandwich where God is love, and it says a bunch of stuff, and God is love. And I had used it in a PowerPoint the, of a Bible study I taught, so I already had the graphic of a real sandwich. That's, that's great. hilarious. Yes, that's totally on brand. <laughs> All right, and you so- can get this sandwich, like the graphics she's talking about, and how uh, we did this with it's a just a little printable that we made up way back when we first started this podcast, um, just by signing up for our newsletter. It's one of the things that you get. So. All right, Christian Andy Writers that net. Okay, I'm going silent. All right, okay. she's in the chamber of silence. Uh, Tina. So we are talking about. Um, oh, hold on. Let's let's address Leah's comment. Whenever I have a scene that I consider a disaster, I take the scene and break it down. That's not what Jen is talking about. Jen is talking about in the romance uh, genre that traditionally there are three disasters that happen and each one is progressively worse until the third disaster. It doesn't have to be like a natural disaster. It just has to be like a misunderstanding or something that makes it seem like these characters cannot be together. And the if third you're, disaster, you're sorry, in the chamber of silence. Okay, you're welcomed out. <laughs> All right. If you're familiar with the snowflake method, that's where I get the word disaster from. It's called other things by other people. But um, yeah, I sorry. I I just threw that out there because we've had lots of episodes on how I outline and and like that. So I just kind of assume. And I think that's another thing you get when you join our newsletter. You do. Yeah. Um, You get Mm -hmm. a a template of her, the way she outlines. The romance plot sheet, we call it. The, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a a quickie. Yep. Yep. Yes. And so this is Jen's first disaster for this couple to where it's looking like uh, no bueno for them. Even though you might want them to get together, you might know, well, this is a romance. That's what's going to happen. This disaster happens at about 25% in, which is what she meant by disaster. Okay. Okay. So she's not necessarily unhappy with the piece. Thanks for clarifying that. No trouble. All right. So uh, let me pull it up over here. And um, Tina, did you want to give a piece of bread about this? Well, I just love Jen's writing. Mm-hmm. And um, as a someone who doesn't generally read romance just for, you know, like in the romance genre, I don't object to romance. Um I always appreciate the depth that she goes through and it's not fluff. And so again, she's just not, she's met my expectations as far as um, the depth that she's gone to through to really develop her characters and just not make it just about the fluff. Yeah, I would totally agree with that piece of bread. And um, my first piece of bread will be that this chapter and the one before it, um, specifically this scene were some of my favorite um, of what I was able to read of this piece. I have um, uh, the privilege of being uh, involved in editing up this work. And so this particular scene was one of my favorites that she wrote. I, I love uh, what it does and I love what it reveals about the characters. Awesome. Okay. So um, do you have any bre- uh, meat you want to share? Yeah, um, I don't know how to categorize all of the comments that I had into one short and sweet, short and sweet piece of meat. But when (laughs) I, (laughs) what I did was I added some things. And when I edit for people, I will write in what I would say. And I try to kind of mimic the author's voice, but then it's understood between myself and the writer or something like this, right? Because I feel like in this piece specifically, because of what the scene is trying to do, there were some pieces of information I felt I would have appreciated as a reader. So I I know because I have a big picture view of this story, like the writer does, what is going to happen and what has been happening and what the characters are thinking. But in this particular scene, as just a reader coming fresh to the piece, I didn't really understand that like, Grant didn't know, or Grant was counting on his family not knowing he'd been fired, for example. So to set this up, Sarah has done something to get 
this man fired. And now here she is in his home and he's just come home and just discovered there she is, the woman who ruined his life. But I did not have the information as the reader that he was trying to keep it on the down low that he had been fired. He was just telling his mom that he was home for the holidays or something. And so I wanted not for that to be revealed in this piece, but for his internal to kind of show me that um, because he might think some things that would hint to the fact that he was trying to keep that a secret. Does that make sense? It does because one of the things that I wrote down is that um, I didn't really understand what she'd done to him mm -hmm. or how she ruined him. And then I put the question, um, is this going to be fresh in our minds if we'd read the previous parts of the book um, or not? Because that's like, what did she do? Like that was my big question when I read that um, sentence. You'll have to buy the book to find out. No, just kidding. But um, <laughs> but absolutely, you would know because the whole first part of the book is setting up um, until you get here to this part in chapter eight. And now it's like uh, the, the incident happened and the two characters went and had some experiences and now here they are reuniting, okay? And so um, for me, that was the bulk of my meat was just adding things that would be internal for him that would reveal his motivations for acting the way that he's acting. And then um, there are some things that I just kind of, uh, author's choice, obviously, but I decided maybe too many words or something and chopped them out. Um, and then other than that, I felt this was pretty clean. I didn't really have a whole lot to quote unquote, suggest fixes for. Um, but primarily it, when the author sees what I typed in here, it was to try to just get a little more of that because this is the scene from his point of view. And previously, um, just before it was her point of view. Right. So um, I just want to understand a little more of what's going on in his head. And I think I'm using too many words to say that. Okay. Um, a couple of things that I had put in here was um, this whole part where she's questioning who he is and what he's doing there. Um, I was just like, my brain was just like, didn't that the other little boy just say, this is my brother. Yeah. So I was a little confused about that, whether or not she would have put that together. Um, also. And like you said, his motivation, I was a little confused and I don't know if it was just my brain going, well, is it just guilt or anger at her or is he like pushing down feelings? And I didn't know that. And so I want to know that. Yeah, there was a little whiff of that in the yeah. beginning because of the inciting incident. So very good feedback for the author, I'm sure, because she will know, good, then that means I did a good job in previous chapters because you want to know that that's probably a little bit of what's going on here. And I agree with you. I erased the comment of like, I could ask the same of you as far as like the, what are you doing here? Because I mean, it's a fancy rich person affair and he's a professor. It seemed a little weird to me that she would be like, what are you doing here? Like, I would mm -hmm. just cut that part right out because first of all, like you said, the little boy said brother, and we're not in her head to understand that she's confused by that. Um, and so for her to say it, I thought felt a little bit strange. So I just like took out that line. Um, I think the scene works just without it even in there. Um, so I had the same piece of meat on that particular point. Okay. And that's really all I had was just trying to understand like what he was feeling. And I, there's like three or four things that I highlighted and said, is what is exactly, is this just guilt? Is this just anger? Or is he have more feelings for her? I so. love that. And then let's um, add in from the chat, since uh, our members of our group have the privilege of seeing this piece before everybody else, Leah Binicki, uh says, the one thing she wanted in between the dialogue was some of the scene, candles glowing in the room, even nonverbal cues. She patted at her hair nervously. He clenches his fist. Um, if the dialogue can breathe, it can stretch out the tension. Um, I, I would say I would maybe want that more before because I feel like this needs to be uh, rapid fire. What are you doing here? No, what are you doing here? Blah, 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 blah. And then it's like this explosive thing that happens and then the dust can settle after. But I agree with Leah that some of those details might have uh, served the piece well earlier in the chapter. What do you think, Tina? Um, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on that because it, for me, it's completely dependent on the circumstances. And I don't know that I care about 
the candles. But that's because I'm not a romance reader. There you go. That's a good point. So, like, if there was a dragon, I would be like, yeah, let's hear <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, so Are you saying like, your piece of meat is you need to add a dragon? <laughs> yes, please add a dragon. No. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I come, I come from the perspective of not being a romance reader and not really understanding exactly what romance readers want. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. perhaps they want that. I like, I can't speak to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I had actually made a note, like, why are they dancing in the parlor? And then uh, Jennifer's comment back to me was like, they're not in the parlor anymore. And I'm like, oh yeah, careful reading. And so it just goes to show that I, as not a romance reader, I'm not really paying too much attention to those little details that maybe other people would like. Mm-hmm. Um And so, yeah, I think that that's good feedback. Obviously, author's choice to add it or not. Piper says she's astonished that nobody could hear him shouting and pounding on the door. That's a really interesting piece of meat. And I would think I would think that I would agree. But then I imagine if you're in a ballroom and there's people talking and there's loud music and he's whisked you away to, to a place where he, as a resident of the house, knows what the situation is. Like I, ex- I would immediately excuse that away in my own head. Did you have any thoughts like that, Tina? What do you think? No, not really. I'm, I just assumed the music was loud. And I mean, if the author wanted to, she could always say something like he had to raise his voice to be heard over the music or, you know, something like that. But yeah. And then this just brings to mind one more teeny weeny piece of meat. This is not the only scene that happens in this particular place. And the level of light that is coming in into this place is important because at one point a character blushes and it's like, can you see the blush? Can you see exp- like how dark is this room? And I know that seems very minor, but it was it was something that kind of popped out at me. Right. Like so um, that was just one more piece of meat. Um, okay. Tina, Leah says, yes, she agrees earlier could work too. And Barbara said, if there was a dragon, LOL, I read across all types and yes, different expectations for different types of stories for sure. And then Leah says, I have never been able to attend a 1920s house party. I like the escape, the comparison, ugly feelings and the beautiful place. Ooh, that's great. I like that. How yeah. poetic. Yeah, and that's a lovely piece of bread. Uh, Tina, you want to wrap up this sandwich with uh, another piece of bread for our author? Sure. I I really enjoyed the tension and the whole um, we misunderstand each other. We like we're at cross, you know, purposes, like cross purposes, cross purposes, and he's going to get her fired, and she needed this job, and like that whole situation, like it was just delicious. Yeah, I like that she's absolutely bewildered. I mean, and I, I'm i angry with the author, but in a happy, good way, angry that we are ripped out of her perspective at this moment. Because it's like, what is she thinking, right? Because uh, for that to happen is going to have some effect on him. But we were just in her head. And so for that moment to happen and for her to take away from me that initial feeling mm-hmm. that Sarah would have was like deliciously painful. So it sounds like a piece of meat, but it's actually a piece of bread because that's the kind of thing that'll keep you reading because you want to know, well, what did she think in that moment? And that will keep you turning pages. Mm-hmm. And I was over here, what are you doing running away? Stay and fight. Like, don't you <laughs> run away like some girl? <laughs> so you want a dragon and a sword added to that. And, and so... Like, but that's what, that's the reaction the author wants from her reader. Like they, she wants them to feel um, this like rift that she's just caused. Yes. And um, great. Uh, K.R. Vanderport is suggesting maybe something like they were far enough from the ballroom that the other guests couldn't hear them. Or he chose the room because no one would overhear their conversation. Maybe, maybe the author can decide um, maybe if she gets other beta feedback that that's a concern. She can put that in there. Yeah. Um, And Kara also says, I love the audience knows what's going on because the two of them trying to figure it out is like a glorious train wreck. I was smiling the whole time. Very nice. Until she started crying, of course. And I felt bad for her. All right. I guess that's mission accomplished, right? Are we ready to let her out of her... Chamber let's, of Silence. I don't know. Yeah, yeah let's, let's let her let stay her in there for a few more minutes. What else can we talk about? I was eating uh-huh. banana muffins the whole time, so I'll go. <laughs> I'll, if I can go get some more, I'm good. <laughs> Only if you share. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, ladies. That was awesome. That was very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, so the family doesn't know he's fired. That's a really good piece of meat because I thought it was kind of obvious. I like so the the key for me as a writer is to not tell my readers what to think, right? I want to be able to like give them enough clues and then to figure it out. I I hate nothing more than a book that constantly is telling me what I should be thinking about everybody, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean, like. Or you tell me every single thing that happens. Like yeah. I can piece things together. I can figure mm -hmm. it out. Like I love a book that makes me think about like, wait a minute, he left the room. <gasps> you know what I mean? Like I, that's what I'm looking for. But it, it, sometimes I miss, you know. And so um, there is a scene before this where he's at a cemetery. And I think I can fit that in there where he has some more internal struggle about not telling his family what has happened and really kind of marinate that. Like that would be because I feel like that scene's missing something anyway. So I think that really gives some insight into him, how he like is feeling about not only that he's upset that he's lost it, but like, how is he going to face his family and blah, blah. I think that's, a, that's a good piece of meat that I'm going to go back and I'm going to work on. I that. love that suggestion, Jennifer, because mm -hmm. that whole thing about his feelings about his father and all of that is also a big part of this story. And yeah. so to set it up even better in that scene when it comes around again will you know what i mean like uh it will feel real good to just like back at the cemetery kind of you know what i mean right awesome. are there are there more than emotional stakes with his family finding out maybe um, because like, he has he these opinions off or something he he has a different idea of what the consequences would be than possibly what reality is but he does not know that Right. Right. It's what we all do. We all think surely this will happen if this is, you know. And there is like a situation of very controlling mother and um, there's like a okay. lot of dynamics here. Um, but I, but um, so at this point you wouldn't know other than the fact that he just doesn't want to disappoint everybody. Right. Cause you can't, okay. I can't give too much because to kind of fast forward a little bit to one of the things you said about um, like, why is she so confused? Well, first of all, the little boy looks nothing like him. The little boy has a different last name. She had no idea that there was any connection that he would even be coming to Michigan because this college was out a different state. Um, except the fact that like um, he, the little boy says, this is my brother. Like she would be dumbfounded for a little bit, but maybe I've missed the mark a bit. I maybe I haven't like done it well enough. If like, you're still like, well, why, why is she confused? So maybe I need to work on that a little bit too. Well, just to um, clarify, I, I wasn't confused that she was confused. I just kind of felt like the comment, I could say the same of you when he says, what are you doing here? That, mm -hmm. that didn't ring true to me because like Sarah would think fancy people at a fancy party you know what I mean? But I, right. I got that she would be completely confused. And that's so why it's just I was that one mad. line. Yes. That's yeah. why I was mad because I wanted to be in her head being like his brother, but he looks nothing like him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then I was like, Ooh, I don't get to have that. So I like right. that. I like and I specifically that. made that choice. You know that like yes. I made that choice to change <laughs> point of view and to put you through that on purpose. Yes. That I wasn't an it. accident. Um, but yes, I like the more internal in Grant's head. You're right. I do need to do that. Um, um, okay. And then the, the people being able to hear him, I thought I was clear that the band had started and it's a big ballroom and then that, and there was enough noise, but I can go back in and reread read that again and see if I need to like be better about that. Um, but overall, yeah, really good feedback. So, um, I'm excited. Like it's going to change a couple chapters now, but that's okay. I'll just, I, I don't mind that. Cause it's going to be better for it in the end by going in and doing yeah. those things. So yeah, appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah. Great feedback. Thank you guys. Oh, so, you're welcome. Is there anything else anybody needs to say about Jen's piece? It's great. It's going to be a great read. I Plus, hope that if, everybody. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this later, um, and you're, and you're a part of our Facebook group, please go in and comment. I'm going to open. Com I close comments so that I wouldn't get any comments before today. So I wouldn't be like tempted to go read critiques, but I'm going to go back to the Facebook group and I'm going to open comments to where I shared this piece. Please feel free to give me feedback, uh, any suggestions that you have. That would be great for us to start some of those kind of conversations. I'd appreciate it. Okay. So just so I know what to do, you turned off comments until today. Is that what you did? Yes. I'm going to go right. in right, right now and, and do that. What a great idea, because after I decide what I'm putting up for you all to look at, I will do the same. Um, here we go. Leah says she agrees that letting the audience figure things out gives them respect. 
And Piper says, yeah, trust your readers to be intelligent. After all, they chose your book to read, right? So they're geniuses. Then, yes. And then <laughs> Leah says she loves the setting and she is very intrigued. And Shell loves that you're doing Sarah's story. Aww. That's great. If you've Aww. read, there are already several books in the series. Jen, give it a little plug before we It is on. my, yes, it is my Love and Lansing series available um, in paperback everywhere and available uh and, um, on Amazon and in Kindle Unlimited. If you're a member of Kindle Unlimited, you can read the whole series. Nice. That's Fourth a... book coming soon. Okay, so let's transition to feeding of the backs. This is where we have had a timer set for 15 minutes just before the podcast begins and a random prompt that we had to use. And we wrote for 15 minutes, no editing, no planning, no revision. And now we are going to read them that way to you live on the air so which is why we only give positive feedback because there has been no time to even think so um uh, mm -hmm. let's start with you jamie why don't you tell us what the prompt is and what you wrote all right our prompt today was use these five words in your story discourage critic experienced seal and hypothesize and here's what i wrote <clears throat> The trick, little girl, is not to let life discourage you. He pulled his thumb across the stick and a long slender strand of bark fell to the ground beneath his feet. There was silence then, unless you count the sound of the cicadas and the noise you hear when you are suddenly aware that the wind is blowing across your very own ears. I pulled a hand across my forehead out of habit, even though I'd just recently retied my hair back and had done a right fine job. Hey now, neighbor, the voice made me jump and I was ashamed. How had I let Mr. Pete sneak up on the place like that? I scowled. It was Mr. Meany's fault, distracting me with talk of high ideas, as if there wasn't work to be done. I huffed and picked up my water pail, focusing hard to walk quickly without spilling a drop, so that I could get to Papa's perch on the front porch before Mr. Pete did. It was a hopeless mission, and I rightly failed, but at least all of the water stayed in the bucket. By the time I was around the front of the house, Mr. Pete was on the porch, guffawing at something Papa had said, and Papa was grinning stupidly around his pipe the way he always did when someone was paying court. Hmm. I had no intention of addressing Mr. Pete. If I couldn't receive him rightly from the front porch, I'd rather not, from up on the porch, I'd rather not see him at all. So I swiveled expertly on my heel headed for the back door, but I'd been spotted. Get your pretty little miss up here and let me get a good look at her, Mr. Pete crowed. And as much as I wanted to be one of the girls who could pretend she didn't know her papa expected her to be a good, polite company for visitors, I knew what I'd see if I were to look over my shoulder to confirm papa's wishes. The one act of rebellion I was comfortable with, though, was not looking. And instead, I slowed my pace and focused all my attention on the water pail, feigning inexperience with balancing the thing, keeping my eyes glued on it as the as on the liquid as if doing so would keep it from sloshing. She's right grown up now, ain't she? Mr. Pete said, and I felt my face grow hot and wished I didn't have something in my hands so that I could hug myself and keep his eyes off my chest where I felt his gaze before I looked up and confirmed it. Suddenly angry, I stood up ramrod straight and righted myself. Howdy do, Mr. Pete, I said in a perfectly flat tone. Mr. Pete whistled low. She's a pretty one, but got a bit of a sour attitude now, don't she? He said. My papa's eyes danced with mirth, and I knew I was okay. You must forgive me. The hot weather has me out of sorts, I said. May I offer you some water? I got something better in water for me and your papa to share, said Mr. Pete. You go on in the house, papa said, gesturing with his pipe, thankfully to the back door. I kept the pretense of carefully balancing the pail up until I was out of sight, even though both papa and Mr. P had moved their attention to the small dark bottle the neighbor had produced. Once around the corner, though, I practically ran with the bucket, and with each step I recommitted to my own personal vow that I would never marry, would never give myself to any of these grimy, slimy excuses for human beings who called themselves men. Ew. And that's, <laughs> a, that's a piece of bread. Ew. Like, Mr. P is disgusting. Like, I don't even know how to, like... How else to say it? Can, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, my computer's being weird. Um, so well written, Jamie. I love how you take like a country character and you add things in, like when while my father was holding court. Like, just so well done. So thank you. 
I mean, it started off like you didn't say that he was whittling a stick. Right. You just said he moved his thumb and that the shaving fell. And um, right, so good. I, I don't know how to put this, but that's not going to sound weird. <laughs> but your whole description of the way she felt about the neighbor took me back mm -hmm. to reality and things in my mm -hmm. past that were real. And you did a really good job of doing that. I appreciate that. In my mind, um, this is just like how things are with these people. Like this is a whole world to me. And, um, and um, this is not the only man that is around who is like, this is just how men are like the men she's experienced are this way, mm -hmm. you know? And um, it's, it's not anything that surprises her or whatever. And um, yeah, like it was really hard to stop writing today. I really enjoy this world. If anyone struggles with show, don't tell, just wa read that one over and over and re-listen to that over and over again. Because Jamie showed us that she had distaste for this person, showed us this person. She didn't say Mr. Pete was creepy. She didn't say Mr. Pete made her uncomfortable. She didn't say any of that, but we knew it just from the, the writing and the way that Jamie uses description. Just so well done, Jamie. Thanks, everybody. I love Friday. <laughs> Piper says, Ick, I do not like Mr. Pete. I was making a face. Like, I couldn't even help it. At the same time, Piper writes that, too. I was like, yeah, Piper and I are feeling the yeah. same. Uh, Leah says, grinned stupidly around his pipe. You intimidate me with your word gymnastics. Oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Shell says, what a creeper. So well done, Jamie. Incredible dialogue and description. Thank you. Um, Piper says, it's not okay that this is her world. Agree. Agree. Leah says, what I want to say, Jamie, stop being so darn good because I am flabbergasted at your wordsmithing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Sorry, my computer is doing something really weird. I'm sorry, Absolutely guys. Absolutely brilliant, it says. Thank you. Um, and then Barbara says, always enjoy your pieces. Think every woman has had similar situation. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Well, I'm going to go next. And um, my... I usually write let me see if i can find it i usually write in my work in progress but i did not do that today i decided to go into the real world into my real life everyday situation so All here right. we go it's mostly dialogue so if don't, i don't want anyone to be confused by that i don't want to discourage you but this needs a lot of work yeah i know well then why aren't you working on it i don't know I keep staring at it, but you're not, you're nothing but a blank. You need to focus. I have no focus. In fact, I think it's 32 on my strengths chart. <laughs> well, what other strengths can you use? Restorative, maybe. I mean, I clearly see what is wrong. I just can't make you figure out what to do about it. That sounds like strategic. Has anybody seen strategic? I think he's in the basement. It rained last <laughs> night. And I saw him <laughs> the water with a wet dry vac. Figures. <laughs> What about communication? Maybe we should find somebody to talk it out with. Maybe. I'll have to think about that. Look, intellection. Nobody asked you to get in on this conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah? And what are you going to do about it? I'd like to see you try and stop me. I think we should find a book or online article about what to do when you're stuck. That's a good idea, learner. But do you remember that we have a stuck list Becca gave us? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Input, for reminding me. Wait. <laughs> I have an idea. Learner, intellection, input, and context all groaned in unison. Adaptability <laughs> began to jump up and down and clap her hands. What if we talk to someone more experienced about what strategy to use? Input can record all the ideas. Intellection can hypothesize which one will work, and then restorative adaptability and I will make sure it gets done. Learner and communication nodded in agreement. Agreement. Intellection stared into space. Input took out a notebook and pen and restorative picked up the phone. Who are we calling? Ghostbusters, shouted connectedness, and <laughs> shrugged at all the looks she got. Everyone's a critic, she mumbled. <laughs> I give this plan my seal of approval, said Strategic, emerging from the basement. Let's do it. <laughs> but who are we calling? Intellection stopped staring into space long enough to say, let me think about it. Yay! That was so much fun to listen to. Absolutely. And so relatable. Right. Yeah. 
it not only was it like well written and enjoyable to listen to, but it shows that you really understand your strengths. You've really taken the time to really learn about them and to f- figure out what they mean to you, to where they can actually talk to you like they're real people. You know, I love it. It's very funny. I love that strategy is in the basement. I know that it's was so great. I wrote yeah. that down. Like, <laughs> where strategy I think it's in the basement. <laughs> oh man. Um, we got uh, Piper says, call out to Becca, LOL. <laughs> and Leah says, haha, I love this, Tina. It feels like the daily struggle for sure. Mm-hmm. Piper says, oh, so fun. Shell says, very, very fun, Tina. Uh, Leah says her strategic is also in the basement (laughs) gathering spiders. KR says, this is brilliant. So fun. Also, all the strengths are so in character. It's awesome. And Barbara says, love the personifications. Oh, yeah. I have these conversations with my brain. Okay. Before we get on to Jen's piece, can I just make a plug for doing this writing sprint? Because Mm -hmm. as you can see, my piece and Tina's piece, same prompt, you guys. And look at the difference in... Uh, output. And we want to see what your particular writerly brain does with these prompts. It's because we know that God made us all because God needs one of each of us. And your voice is going to be a unique voice that is meant to be heard. And we want to hear it. So please take a moment to do this prompt so that we can add it to the, wow, look at all of the different things that God created. Yes. Agreed. Okay, Jen, what did you come up with today? All right. So if you listened last week, you'll know that I was writing, still writing in my Widows of the West kind of world, the first book. And we left Colleen standing on the sidewalk or boardwalk, whatever, looking at the saloon across the street. Oh, yeah. So Mm -hmm. I picked right up there. And um, I don't think I used any of the words. (laughs) I think I used one. I, I wrote a sentence and then I went ahead of that sentence and I wrote everything up leading to that sentence. But interesting. We'll see, so. All right. It's just okay. All right. <clears throat> all of her disappointments, all the loss she had endured had stemmed from that rickety old building that passed as a watering hole. Watering hole was a polite way to describe a business that profited on the drunkenness and depravity of weaker men. Hole wasn't a bad descriptor, actually, for once a man stepped inside, he'd find himself in the depths of sin and debauchery, unlike anything Colleen had ever experienced. Although she could imagine if Denny's drunken bragging held any truth to it. And it probably did since Colleen had found that to be the only time the man was capable of telling the truth. Once the booze had loosened his tongue and weakened his resolve. She had only seen the building once at night early on in her marriage. When Denny had failed to come home, she had worried herself near sick and had decided to go looking for him. She never made it inside. She didn't need to. With the doors propped open, loud music pouring through them, she could full well see all she needed to, including a scantily dressed woman atop her husband's lap. A motion at the door of the saloon caught her attention, pulling her out of the unpleasant memory. The saloon door swung open, making the way for for what Colleen could only assume was a patron that had spent the night inside, or more accurately, upstairs, where the ladies of the establishment entertained overnight guests. The man stepped through the doors and into the sunlight, lifting his face as he did, and Colleen's world came crashing to a halt as she recognized the last person she ever expected to see. Cade. Three, two, one. No, it did not end there. You did Well, it did. I, there's one more sentence I, I think <laughs> doesn't work. So I'll read it. I don't think All it right. works. Colleen had experienced mes- many disappointments in her life, but nothing could have prepared her for this. No, that is more of like a, like, that's what this is going to be about. And then you Yes. Write. You know what I right. mean? Right. Yeah, because it's a sprint. So, like, you don't know really what you're doing. And then I, I wrote that. I started typing after it. And it didn't work up there either. So, I'm like, I'll try ending with it. So, then I went ahead of it. And I started typing. And then I feel like it. So, the sentence, like, it's a sprint. But in the final draft, that won't even be there. I know it won't. It doesn't work for me. So, yeah, sorry, it's a little too deep of a critique for a Friday, but um, right. at the end of the day, like, yeah, that's really disappointing. Uh, and so good job because you set us up to be like, what a horrible place. And then out comes our wonderful Kate, who we are like, no, right? all of us. Yeah. What's so he doing good. in there? Because I have no idea. <laughs> like, what in the world? <laughs> and, I and have an idea. It's, it's deeper, really, than showing us what goes on in there it was the betrayal yes yeah of her first husband and the things that he did in there that um made her world a hell 
Yes. And then to see this new guy that she thought better of that she mm-hmm. has feelings for mm-hmm. come out of there. Yeah, that is a disaster. That's it's definitely a disaster that I'm for sure gonna use this. Yeah. I mean it's gonna be all reworked and rewritten. But um yeah. Because I Sorry, Shell's got ahead. a ooh, and Leah says, Jen, ouch, what a vivid display. Weak men and their vices. Uh, Piper gasped, oh no, he was looking for someone and thought maybe the person would be there, she's suggesting, but I know you're going to come up with your what ifs. Mm-hmm. K.R. Vanderport, the part where she says that being drunk is the only time he actually told the truth just totally sums up that character. Great work. Barbara says, ah, cheating husband in a saloon. What could be next since she has such a negative connection? And then Piper says he was visiting his sister. Ooh, that's mm. interesting. Wow. Wow. That's really an interesting uh, possible plot twist. I like that. Mm. I can't wait to get into this series. Yeah. I have, I have all four of the books. Well, three of the four books. No, sorry. Yeah, four. three of the four books almost completely outlined except for the first book is the one I'm struggling with because I've been like in the world, I think so much and just writing this and that and like, just like sprinting in it. I really got to focus on the disasters and focus on like, I know what their hurts are. I know what like they're struggling with, but I need to make it like more, I got to fit it into like a a story structure. And um, I don't think I've caused them enough pain. As I think about why I'm having problems. So when this, when I wrote this today, I'm like, okay, now I'm, I'm getting to some pain. Now it's going to hurt. So. KR you- says she's attached to your characters and you can tell because when he came out, she was like, no way. He wasn't doing anything bad. He <laughs> Thanks, KR. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I was going to say like, it takes your readers on that same journey of, oh, I really mm-hmm. like this guy. Oh, maybe like he's not what I thought. And uh-huh. am I that stupid that I would fall for another guy like this? Like it totally mm-hmm. takes your reader on that journey. Relatable. So depending on where this falls, because I kind of already know what my final disaster is. Um, so depending on where this falls, if this becomes my midway point, then you know it's gonna be followed with a kiss. And can you imagine the epic kiss after this one when she, you know, when he has to like, yeah, it's gonna be good. He has to. Good. He has to. Because he, I mean, it's Cade. He has to have some sort of excuse. He's not in there doing what she thinks he's doing. It's he's Cade. Trying to save their souls. Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, there's so many possibilities. Ooh, what a fun brainstorming session. This is why, again, on what Jamie said, this is why sprinting is so important, especially if you're struggling with your story. Like, you don't know what the, the timed thing, the, the pressure it puts on you, and just letting your just your hands just go, it takes over, and you don't know how it's going to help your story. And this is going to, this totally, I mean, like, look at what, what we're talking about in the conversation in the chat already. You all can agree. This is already going to make the story so much more, like, juicy, right? More like, yeah. oh, like better. It's going to be a better story. So. And let me just say, you may include it in your book, but even if you didn't, now you have this this if this were to happen with these characters Mm -hmm. what did you learn and now they'll be realer to you realer more real to you when you write them later because Mm -hmm. when i was a new writer i felt like i was wasting words if i did a sprint that would never end up being published Mm -hmm. and now i see how ridiculous that way of thinking is because it's like are you a writer or aren't you? You'll write more words. Like, are, are there just a finite number of words that you're going to write in your life and they all have to be publishable? Or are you writing to become a better writer? Yes, it's like right. all of the exercises that you do will make you a better writer. If you were going to be a black belt in karate, you would do your forms every day. And mm-hmm. if you want to be a good writer, you're going to be writing and writing and writing, even if it's stuff that nobody's going to read. But that will that's one of the reasons why you become a better writer just from writing. That's true. Very, very true. If you're true. using the process I'm using right now, you're writing to discover the story. And not everything you discover is worthy of putting in the book. Right. Some of okay. it is just stuff that you need to know about your characters. Mm-hmm. All right. One more word about sprinting before we wrap things up. Leah says she sprinted the other day. Her character totally flipped the script and acted way more mature than I was ready for. It was supposed to be a fight scene. I had to adapt. She was taking over. (laughs) Non-writers just don't understand sometimes. And Barbara says practice, practice, practice. Very good. Okay. So now it's time to transition to our what's next 
section of the podcast. And so I'm going to start with you today, Jen. What is next for you? Well, I'm going to be rewriting a couple of scenes that I thought were all finished (laughs) 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 to to give uh, Grant some more internal thoughts and to clarify some things. But yeah, that's my goal this week is to go back and fix those two chapters a little bit better. And then um, I got to get some editing done. So life is kind of starting to level out for me a little bit. And um, school is going to be starting up here pretty soon. So I really got to get a bunch of work in before I, you know, have to start facing that as well. So that's, it's editing, editing, editing. I can't say editing. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tina? What's up for you? What's next? Well, I had a, a coaching call with um back with not with Becca with um Nikki, which is one of the strengths coaches with the for the Be- right better faster organization. And I was talking about how I have all these things that I've tried, all these processes or systems, if you will, that have worked for me in the past. But then I get bored or they start stop working, and I have to change. And I feel like I can't find the one thing that's going to work for me. And like, I'm still searching for my, like that perfect, the magic bullet, I guess you would say. And she said something to me, which stopped me in my tracks. And she said, why do you need one thing? And she started talking about my high adaptability. And she said, why can't you have this list of things that work for you? And when something stops working, you get bored with it. Just go find another one to use for that day. And let your, because the new, my adaptability and my ideation and a lot of my strengths want the new and the different. Mm -hmm. And when something's not new and different, it stops working. So I made a list. I actually have 10 different systems that work for me. It's just, if I keep doing them too much, they stop Mm -hmm. working. Uh... And so I'm going to, I'm going to figure out like what feels exciting to me. To like tomorrow or today when I sit down to do my writing, I'm going to, I'm going to block out the time and have that schedule, but I'm going to see what feels good. Like what makes me feel excited about today? If I use it, is it going into office hours? Is it finding someone to talk to my, about my manuscript with? Is it, um, all these other, I have 10 different things and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to see if, like switching it up like that will help my brain not get bored and not just go, okay, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So that's my, and if you go don't know anything about strengths work, I'm sorry, but like, that's like what's really big in my head right now. And what I've been, we have lots of episodes about Clifton strengths or at least two (laughs) anyway, Clifton strengths, do a search for that on our YouTube channel and you will see a very thorough discussion of that. So if you look for the quit cast, Q U I T C A S T. She talks about all the strengths and, Mm -hmm. and how they affect people. So that's me. What about you, Jamie? What's next for you? All righty. Well, I will not be around next Friday. If you want to hit me up to find out why, if you don't know why you can, but it is personal stuff. So you can um, ask, but I just ask that you would pray for me because it's going to be a rough day in my personal life. And at the same time, I'm doing like a school uh, boot camp to learn computer coding. And so at the same time that it feels like I'm getting to a climactic place in my personal life. I've got another capstone project, which is a great big project that you do to put into your programming um, uh, portfolio. And so I have to work with another person on this capstone project. And it's a really big thing. And so the two things are happening at the same time. And so I just need prayers for like mental fortitude to do all of these things, which I guess I'm glad that it'll be like busy because quiet time during this time would not be great. Um, I do have to give a shout out to my friend, Kim Hanan, who will be coming to be with me for the next couple of weeks also. And she's a great friend. She's not the kind of friend where it's like, if you're not able to entertain her, she's gonna, you know, uh, uh, feel offended. She's going to come here and just be like, another presence in the home to support me and encourage me as I go through this next couple of weeks. So I covet your prayers and thank you for them in advance. And I'll be back in two weeks. If you join our Facebook group, uh, fans of the Christian Indie Writer, listeners, listeners, yes, listeners of the Christian Indie Writers podcast, 
hopefully sometime soon, I will put in there the piece that I'm going to ask Jen and Tina to give me feedback about. And um, you can review it just like you did for Jen's piece today. And in two weeks, um, I will be back to hear everybody's feedback about that. Awesome. Okay, so next week, um, Jen and I are going to talk about what makes authors um, successful. What what does that mean to us? Um, and I'm going to actually be out of town, so hopefully there are no um, technical. Otherwise, questions. it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Jen will be doing hair and makeup uh, tutorials the efficient way. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's one thing you won't see. <laughs> I'm going to be in Washington state staying with my mom for a couple of weeks, but I'm pretty sure that her internet is stable enough that I should be able to be on here. No problem. Um, the only problem is going to be getting up that early because <laughs> shell can tell you it's early over there mm -hmm. on the West coast. So, um, but we're going to be talking about what we believe makes a successful author. Um, mm -hmm. So if nobody else has anything to add, we will just that you want to head on over to our Facebook group and, and join there. And people are sharing their, their work, um, their sprints from this week. They're over there. You can go out and take a look at those and lots of fun stuff happening on that, in that group. So make sure you come and join it. For sure. Okay. So to wrap it up until next week, may your pen be prolific, your deadlines be met and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Now.